My boyfriend of five years and I recently moved to Texas from Iowa, where both our families live, to a new subdivision outside of a small town. The house we bought is at the end of a cul-de-sac with a huge field with nothing but trees behind it. We were both so excited to be starting our new lives together and to have bought our first house. We also have two dogs, basically our children. My boyfriend decided he was going out with some new co-workers to the city, about 35 minutes away. I didn't feel like going. I love being home alone because I can snack and watch scary movies he never wants to watch. So after getting home around 6 p.m. from work and the grocery store, I barricade myself and the dogs in my bedroom to commence the scary marathon of awesomeness. Side note, my dogs become on edge when my boyfriend isn't home at night and randomly bark at seemingly nothing. It freaks me out a bit, but I've become used to it. We have one window in our room that's right next to our bed. I usually have the windows open, letting the night air in, but tonight I only cracked it. So I'm balls deep in some cheesy 80s horror flick and the dogs start barking. Ah, stop! I always take notice when they bark, just in case. I turn the light on and look around. Nothing. Lights off. Back to the dits running up the stairs. It's now around 11, and I'm sure my boyfriend will be gone a couple more hours. No biggie. The dogs start barking again. This time they don't stop. So slowly, I look out the window. I don't see anything until I catch it. At the bottom of the window, peering up at me, are a set of eyes. Not the whole face, not even the nose, just the eyes. The window is pretty low to the ground, so this man was crouching down. I thought it was my boyfriend trying to scare me. We sometimes like to do that, but not to this extent. So of course I try to play it off like I'm not scared. Calvin, you're dumb. Seriously, it's not funny. The staring continues. Uh, okay, you're really milking this. It's hilarious. Now stop, really. You're freaking the dogs out. Then the eyes start slowly moving, but moving sideways, in a straight line, so I can't see the face, and then sliding up it, so I can only see one eye until the man is fully standing up. Clearly too big to be my 5'11 boyfriend. I freeze. I've always thought of myself as tough and from watching so many scary movies, able to deal with sketchy situations until now. I literally didn't move and the dogs were still going crazy. He just stares. Finding my voice, I yell at the psycho to leave, and I'm calling the cops. That's when he takes a side step into full view of me. He just stands there while I dial for the police, stammering over my words, and then I hear something tap on the window. He's tapping on it with a huge knife, and he must have gotten the reaction he wanted because a slow, sadistic smile slides across his face. Knowing full well that the police are coming, he takes one large step backwards and stands there for forever, it seems like. Each step backwards is slow and deliberate while maintaining the most bone-chilling smile until he reaches the fence. He climbs over, still staring in the direction I see him peek over the fence one last time before disappearing into the night. The cops never found him. This story takes place about two years ago. 
My aunt, who's married into the family, has cousins who live on a farm in La Pointe, Utah, on a reservation, and thought it would be fun to have all us other cousins go stay there for a few days and see the Dinosaur National Monument. My aunt's grandmother had recently passed away, and her house was basically empty, so we were to stay there. It was a pretty old house, to say the least. It was made out of painted white cinder blocks, and was pretty run down. But we were only staying there for a few days, so we didn't care about how luxurious it was. The front door led into a small kitchen, and off the kitchen to the right was a small room with a TV, two couches, and a chair. Off of that room was a larger living room area, with two more pull-out couches and a door leading to the side of the house. Off the living room was a hall that led to two small bedrooms and a bathroom. It was a pretty small house, considering we had around 18 people staying there. Along with the old empty house we were staying in, there were two other houses on the property, belonging to my aunt's cousins and their families. These were the only houses for about two miles. There were twelve kids in total, ranging from ages three to sixteen, me being the oldest. We all slept on pull-out couches and the floor. Other than the parents, there were two other people who were staying there. They were soon to be married, so they were staying there for a few days before the wedding. It was a whole big mess of people, but bear with me. They didn't want to sleep in the same house, because they weren't married. So the guy, we'll call him B, was sleeping in a small camper outside, while his fiance slept in one of the bedrooms. Now we can get to the actual creepy shit. On the first night we were there, one of the cousins and I were on the pull-out couch in the first little room while all the other kids were either on other couches or the floor, in either our room or the other. It was about midnight. Most of the kids were already asleep. We were watching Disney movies and dozing off when we started to hear strange noises outside toward a field. It sounded like low growling and panting, but not entirely like it was coming from an animal. There was just this weird human-like sound to it. I assumed it was some sort of stray animal and got up to see. When one of the kids who lived next door, we'll call him L, jumped up and told me to just ignore it and go to sleep. I was really confused and the noises were still happening. But the terrified look on his face told me I should listen. The thing was pacing around the house and stopping by the door in the kitchen for a few minutes before continuing to circle. Neither of us got any sleep that night. The next night was basically the same setup. Kids sleeping everywhere, movies playing, a few people dozing off. I was exhausted from the night before and managed to fall asleep when I was woken up by one of the youngest kids, quietly crying and crawling into bed with me. We'll call him A. I asked him what was the matter, and he said he was scared by the big dog outside the window. I turned to L and asked if they had a dog. He looked completely scared shitless and said no, and told me to ignore it once again. I stayed up for a while after that, watching movies with A, when he asked me to walk with him to the bathroom, so I did. I switched on the light, and then we see it, an extremely tall, dog-like creature standing on its hind legs, facing the window looking into the living room. Its fur was matted and its eyes seemed to be almost glowing orangish red. Its hands looked human-like, but with dark fur and long claws. 
A screamed, and the creature ran around the side of the house on its hind legs. I picked him up and carried him back into the living room to find L quickly closing the curtains. What the hell is that? I whispered. I don't know. If you ignore it, it'll go away, he whispered back. You've seen it before? Only a couple times, but not recently. What the fuck? Our talking woke up Elle's younger sister, and surprisingly nobody else. I'm guessing she knew what was going on, because she seemed just as scared as we were. I sat A down on the bed, and turned up the TV louder, drowning out the sounds the creature was making outside and hoping to calm us down a bit. The noises circling the house continued for about half an hour more, when they stopped at the back door in the other room. I peered my head around the corner to face the door. It was kind of like one of those doors that the top half is just a screen, and then there was another separate door that wasn't closed. The door handle on the first door started moving back and forth, and you could see the silhouette of something huge behind it. I rushed over and shut and locked the other door, trying not to wake everyone else. Just as I did, the guy sleeping in the camper outside burst through the kitchen door, slamming it behind him. We asked what was going on, but he didn't say a word and rushed down the hall and into the bedroom his fiancée was in. He came out holding a shotgun and pulled a chair into the corner of the living room, giving him a view of both the kitchen and the back door. He gave us a look of both terror and anger. He told us to go to sleep. We didn't. He sat there all night until the noises stopped around sunrise, then went back outside into the camper without saying a word. I'm surprised no one else woke up. No one else knows what happened that night. My husband used to work graveyard most nights, so that left me home alone with our two-year-old daughter. This was a normal thing for us, and we would stay up watching movies and playing games. Now at the time, we were living in a rental house and I had previously had weird feelings and cold chills in the house. But I didn't think too much about it, since we hadn't been living there long and were still adjusting. One night, I was sitting in the living room crocheting a blanket and watching a TV show while my daughter was playing in her bedroom. I heard a lot of giggling and laughing from her and so I wasn't too concerned with what she was doing. After a few, I realized that she had been quiet for a while, so I got up to go check on her. When I walked into her room, I found her sitting on the floor, facing the baseboard heater, just staring. I watched her for a moment, and then I asked her, What are you doing? Her reply made my skin crawl and the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It has no eyes, Mommy. I stood there for a moment, and then said, It's a heater, honey. It doesn't have eyes. To that she replied, It did, Mommy, and now they're gone. I just stood there frozen, as she continued with, It was talking to me, Mommy, and then its eyes just left. At that point I was freaked out enough, that I ran in and grabbed her, and ran out of the room slamming the door shut behind me. As I was carrying her from her room to the living room, she looked towards the kitchen window that didn't have curtains and said, I see him in the kitchen window, Mommy. I was panicking at this point because I wasn't sure if she was actually seeing a person outside or what. So I walked faster into the living room and got her onto the couch. I changed the TV to cartoons and went to look out the window in the kitchen. Nothing. I went back into the living room and my daughter was at the big front window, 
peeking through the blinds. I said in a shaky voice, What are you doing? She replied with, He's out front now, Mommy. At that point I was freaked out of my mind, and ran around and checked all of the locks on the doors and windows. I tried calling my husband, but he didn't answer because he was busy working. We spent the rest of the night in the living room, huddled up on the couch. I never actually saw anything that night, but in nights past, I had thought I'd seen a dark shadow go across the wall in her room. I didn't think anything of it until this happened. We were staying in a villa nestled in the hills, several miles outside Campredon, Catalonia. The villa itself was an ancient, stone-built thing at the end of a stony driveway that snaked its way down from the road. I remember it and its newly installed swimming pool overlooked a grassy clearing, rolling off downhill towards the tree line. This was a family holiday in August of 99, and I was six years old at the time. It was just my mother, my father, and I. My dad had recently been offered a new job as a financial controller for a satellite phone company with a start date three weeks away. Two weeks of that time had been reserved for our retreat to the isolated leafy hills, and I think I was as excited as mom to spend some time with my very busy dad. Before we start, I'd like to just let you know that my dad has helped me in confirming some details in this story, although he didn't seem happy about it. When I asked if we could talk about that holiday, there was a rather drawn-out silence before he began to speak in a low, wavering voice. I know as well as anyone how childhood memories can be heightened, warped, or eroded over time but every hair on my body prickled as Dad confirmed every single one of the dark details that still lingered in my mind. When we weren't exploring the history of the nearby towns or dining in fancy restaurants and cafes that were utterly wasted on me, I spent my time pottering about the aforementioned clearing and the fringing woods with a pair of binoculars and an empty jam jar. An outdoorsy child through and through, I was happy collecting beetles or watching the jays as they hopped between branches and let out their oddly endearing scream. My parents stuck together like glue, blissfully naive. I was completely unaware of mom's continuing difficulty in processing my maternal grandfather's death two years prior. It was another relentless hot summer's afternoon when this all started. My parents sunbathed on the veranda, paperbacks in hand, while I trudged across the uneven grasses of the clearing towards the forest on another expedition. I remember how the golden afternoon light became an artificial dusk after just a few minutes walk into the tree line. I had picked up a stick and I poked at the mud in front of me as I followed a small stream downhill and deeper into the forest. I remember being convinced I'd find a dinosaur fossil. It's funny now. Perhaps it was this absolute innocence that protected my mind from what happened in those woods. The stream widened into a shallow, slow thing dotted with large, flat stones that I hopped between. It all started as the stream ran parallel to the hillside. I reached the end of my path of stepping stones and found that my stream had widened into a shallow pool. I had dipped my hand into the water and plucked out a smooth, disc-shaped pebble when a voice spoke gently from the trees as not to startle me. The voice is one of the details I remember the clearest. It didn't frighten me then, but now that memory terrifies me. 
It sounded like a recording of a normal voice played backwards. Does that make sense? It's good to see you again. The voice spoke, and I turned to look. What I saw was an approximation of my deceased grandfather, off in the woods on my left. It wasn't a misty apparition or anything like that, but was instead a decidedly material form. I don't remember what it wore, but I remember that it had my grandfather's bushy mustache and gold front tooth. The eyes were wrong, though. While my grandfather had indeed had brown eyes, the brown of this thing's eyes extended beyond the iris. There were no visible whites, only the chestnut brown with tiny pupils fixed on me. Later, as a teenager, my father reminded me of other details I had initially relayed to him, but had chosen to forget. In 1998, we had traveled up to the Scottish Highlands on another family holiday. There, we had been having a picnic when I saw a red deer stag shedding velvet. I remember the horror as I had noticed the raggedy, bloody antlers atop its head, fearing the poor animal had been grievously injured. My parents had laughed and reassured me that this was normal and the stag was okay. Well, according to Dad, I later described the grandfather thing in the forest as having similarly tattered antlers sprouting from his greasy hair. I don't remember much else other than its bloated waxy skin. The grandfather thing did not terrify me as one might expect. Instead I stood fixated atop my rock. It also stood staring my way, unaffected by my attention. After a tense moment's silence, I spoke up. Who are you? I think I asked. It responded in that awful voice, raising one hand limply. I live here. I remember that very clearly. While I was almost hypnotized by the creature, these words triggered a feeling of unease. Why do you look like Grandad? It told me it didn't want to scare me. That didn't really answer my question. The thing was now close to the stream bank, and I don't remember seeing it move. I remember it smiling, and it was a sickly imitation of a friendly gesture. The gray lips were pulled back. It looked more like a grimace. He was drooling. I need you to build me a bridge across this stream. I asked why it couldn't just use the stepping stones. Still, I didn't feel the abject terror I should have felt. This thing's appearance, its voice. The memories make me shudder now but at the time I was simply bemused. It told me that the bridge needed to be made of wood, sticks, and branches, and laid across a narrow section. Why do you need a bridge so bad? I asked it. And it told me that it needed to get home. By this point, the feeling of uneasiness had begun to border on a sense of dread and I remembered my mother's strict rules about talking to strange grown-ups. Funny, it was that, and not the antlers or mimicry of my dead grandfather, that sparked a response in me, and I leapt from my stepping stone and bolted, trudging through leafy mold and moss as I ascended the hillside. I made a beeline to the villa, bursting from the darkened forest into the clearing, still lit by the setting sun. I sprinted into the kitchen, free of my hypnotized stupor, and told my dad everything. Now he tells me his thought process at the time. 
As far as he understood, an old man had cornered his son in the woods, and he was seeing red. He apparently asked me all sorts of questions about this man, before storming outside with a kitchen knife and a torch, leaving my hyperventilating mom and I in the villa. Now I'll tell you what he told me. He stormed across the clearing and into the forest, following the stream off to the right, until he reached the pool I had described. Upon reaching the pool, he spent almost an hour patrolling the surrounding woods, brandishing that knife. Even as the sun set and plunged the forest into absolute darkness, with no luck, he returned to the stream's loamy banks and scanned for the man's boot prints. He recalls finding nothing but hoof prints that he initially attributed to one of the region's feral hogs. These hoof prints indicated a heavy boar, and the stream bank was heavily scarred by such prints. According to Dad, it looked as if a single large pig had paced repeatedly up and down the southern bank for days on end, with no marks on our villa's side of the stream. He had been investigating one of these prints when his torchlight illuminated his own reflection in the water. In the reflected half-light behind his panicked face, he had seen someone standing over his shoulder. In his own words, to 18-year-old me in 2011, it was like Grandad if he had been left in a river. With pallid gray skin and even the ghastly antlers I had described. Dad had then wheeled around, his torch illuminating nothing but trees. He returned to the kitchen of the villa then, muddy and afraid. That was the first time I saw my dad cry. He told my mom that he had run into the pervert and chased him off. The truth of that night became a secret between my dad and I. And I've only managed to amass these details on those rare nights that we've been alone together long enough to talk about it. He's never been willing to talk about it without my prodding. These events are long in the past, but I can still remember my father's voice wavering as he described those endlessly pacing footprints trampled into the mud. I can only hope that no other innocent child has built that creature the bridge it so desired, and that it's still trapped on the southern side of the stream. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to... Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. If you want me to tell your story or read a creepypasta, email me at the address in the... Jesus fucking... Email me at the address in the description. Ripley, we've done another one. <sighs> Hello? What do you want? Didn't you get the fucking clue the first two times you called in a row? Yeah, I know I should have had it on silent. I figured you got the hint that I was busy. Well, you're just full of fucking information, aren't you? You're the best. Okay, what, what do you want? I know it's your birthday tomorrow. And maybe I'm going to come, but you know, it's preseason football and all that. I might just mail you your gift. Yeah, I got you. I did get you a gift. I shit into a box. Happy fucking birthday. Because you're an asshole. When are you going to die, by the way? Let's wrap that up. Yeah, I know you love me. But I gotta get back to this.
So, have a good night. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Mom. Be good to animals, even people. And especially your mom. See ya! Yo, Hey, I was thinking of doing that thing where I, I'm really mean to someone on the phone and then at the end it's you. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to say? Whatever. Fantastic.